Hello world, welcome to the fourth episode of Outside the Valley, a podcast where we interview remote startup leaders, workers, remote work advocates, and companies who thrive outside of Silicon Valley. This is a podcast where remote companies share what works and what doesn't, so you can do it right. Outside the Valley is brought to you by ARC, the remote hiring platform that enables companies to hire remote software engineers and teams easily. I'm your host, Jovian Gautama. Today on the show, we have Justin Mitchell, the founder and CEO of Fiat Chat, a voice collaboration tool for remote teams. The Yak on Yak Chat is an acronym of Yelling Across Cubicles, YAC, which we'll talk about in this episode. Justin is also the founder of a software development company called So Friendly, based in Florida. We're going to dive into how Justin got his very first startup gig in high school, how Yak Chat got traction on Product Hunt's Makers Festival, the importance of high resolution communication in remote teams, the role of voice in the future of remote work and our everyday life, and much more. I had a blast with Justin, and I hope you enjoyed this episode. Here we go. So to kick things off, Justin, can you tell us a bit more about yourself and your company, starting with So Friendly? Sure. Yeah. So I've been involved in startups for for years now. I, I got hired in high school in 11th grade, actually, for my first startup. Um, I, I got hired initially actually to do IT work for them and then didn't do any IT work. I immediately became a designer there. Um, overheard a conversation about them needing a UI design. I raised my hand and said, hey, I've got a pirated version of Photoshop on my computer. Wow. <laughs> and boom, I became their UI designer, which is not typically how uh, you kind of fall into that career. But right. um, from there, I, I kind of fell in love with that process of building out UIs. We, you know, bought me a license of Photoshop and oh, the whole wow. Adobe Creative Suite. I learned to kind of on the job, on the spot, which was really awesome. And uh, from there, that company, I kind of popped around to a couple different startups with that CEO. We built some products together. And uh, when I was 19, I was fortunate enough to have my startup, my idea, my product actually come out as a startup and we IPO'd, which is crazy at 19, right? Like what's the Super likelihood crazy. that your first try right. IPOs? Um, so from there, I, I took that exit opportunity with the startup and launched So Friendly. And I learned a lot at that startup, especially just about how uh, different companies kind of approach product development. And one right. of the things that I identified was especially a very engineering focused company. They're building things that they think are really cool, that they think is a great idea, but they haven't necessarily talked to their users. They're not asking their customers what they want. They're not user testing it. And so, so friendly is this kind of call to action for startup founders to build things that are so friendly that their users just fall in love with them. Um, so the, the company exists and the agency is as a whole started on this kind of uh, call to action to say, look, if you're going to build something, build it beautiful, build it amazing talk to the users, put it in front of them, ask them questions, you know, do all this upfront work instead of just like launching something. And then you finally get it in front of a user and they're like, yeah, we didn't ask for any of this. We don't want any of these features. These don't make sense to me. I would never use this product. Right. And then you've just wasted all this time and money. So uh, a lot of what we do as an agency is, is push back and say, all right, so that's your idea. Let's validate it. Let's talk to your customers. Let's figure out what they want. Let's put it in front of them. Let's do some user testing. Uh, and you wouldn't believe the, the difference that it truly is in the marketplace. I think a lot of people would look at that and say, that's obvious. Everyone should do that. But in agencies in particular, um, especially when you think about like the offshore agencies that people typically go to, it's mm -hmm. sure, I'll take your money, right? Like mm -hmm. you want to pay for this? I think it's a dumb idea, but I'll take your money. No worries. Mm -hmm. um, and we really wanted to be different. And that was that idea that like, hey, we might even say no to you. We might say, look, right. we really don't think this is a good fit. Uh, we think you should go back to the drawing board a little bit. We're more than happy to help you, right? And we even have specifically kind of geared towards low end packages where we'll say like, look, we're going to help you uh, build this out before we actually build it out. We're going to help you build a plan and mm -hmm. put together a requirement. Uh, so yeah, that kind of bleeds into 
everything that we do and we build. And what's cool about So Friendly is a lot of times we will identify kind of a hole in the market and we'll fill it. So we had a site called Syrup for Startups that was just discounts and deals for startups and entrepreneurs. You know, fifteen mm-hmm. percent off time tracking, ten percent off your invoicing software. Uh, you know, twenty percent off QuickBooks, like just different things like that. Because we said, hey, it's really expensive starting a business. Let's mm-hmm. do a discount site just for startups. And so we launched that, and we started building out VR products, and we saw that there was a need for good VR design tools. So we we built that called Draft XR, which is actually coming out soon for Adobe XD. Oh, cool. Uh, so there's like all those different things that we do. And um, I know we're going to talk about it in a second, but that's yep. where Yak came from, right? Nice. Is this, okay. I identified a problem. We talked to our customers. We saw this issue. And then we just built a solution for it, which is what we've always liked about So Friendly is it wasn't just an agency. It was always kind of this entrepreneurial mm-hmm. design agency combo. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, since you mentioned about Yakjet, which is actually uh, the main reason that we have this interview, because I really want to learn about Yakjet, the tool, and how it enables uh, remote teams to work better together. Hey, that's a good tagline. Um, yeah. so, so for the listeners um, here, can you share a bit more about Yakjet and what does it do? Yeah, sure. So like I said, you know, so friendly typically identifies a problem and we build a solution for it. And what we saw, especially in our agency clients was meetings, 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 right? Just tons and tons of meetings. And so uh, what we typically saw as an agency in our time is lots of wasted time, uh, lots of downtime, meaning we're not actually working. We're scheduling a meeting. We're in a meeting. We're going to our next meeting. We're getting off of a call. And the interruption and flow there is huge, especially for like a designer or a developer. And so what we wanted to do was not say cut off meetings because meetings and hearing someone's voice and talking to someone is so important, especially in a remote team. Uh, what we wanted to do was find a way to kind of have the best of both worlds, which was to say, you should still communicate. And we think that's very important to get on a phone call and actually talk something out. But at the same time, uh, 20 minute or even an hour long uh, meeting is so disruptive to your to your day to day work. And so we tried to find this balance between is there a way that we can have you talk to your teammates, talk to your clients, talk to your customers, whatever it might be, uh, but it not actually interrupt your flow, but it not also cut down on that kind of personal connection. And so that's sort of the genesis of Yak was this idea of we need to keep you out of meetings. There's a time and a place for them but we need to find a middle ground between like Slack and a phone call. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. That totally makes sense. But actually I'll be very honest with you. When I first came across Yak chat, I actually couldn't think of a specific use case on how, how I personally will use it because in my mind, right. When you're working async, especially when you're working in a distribute teams, um, you want to have written documents that you can always revisit. Like if, for example, if I leave a voice message to my CEO, for example, in my mind, there's a risk that he or she will probably forget about it. Um, am I thinking about this wrongly? No, so it's, it's like a 50-50, right? So right. what's interesting is um, right now we're talking about async is we're thinking, um, what's great about it is it's respecting each person's time. And what's mm-hmm. awesome is that Uh, from an emotional perspective, I get my opportunity to speak. So if I'm upset and I need to say something, I get to say it when I need to say it. I don't have to wait for them to become available. I don't have to ask them for a calendar invite. I just get to say it, which is really powerful in terms of allowing me to speak my voice and being able to feel like I was heard, right? Um, On the flip side of that, the documentation side of it, I think is almost like a completely different use case and we're building things out for that. So let me cover kind of both sides of it. So what we've seen from a team building perspective is somebody gets upset, they go on a rant inside of Slack. Um, What typically happens is the next time you get, you know, come into work the next day, that's now just staring at you in the face, right? right? You just said a bunch of incredibly mean things. You were upset, you were angry, you were ranting and all of your curse filled rants are now just in the Slack channel, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of cemented there and it is 
uh, void of emotion. It doesn't really tell the person how you really feel. They just know that you're upset and you're saying things that maybe you don't even know. Uh, when you do it over voice, you're much more careful about the way that you say things. Uh, emotion comes through much better. Right. And so the person on the other hand can truly like understand, wow, this person's upset. They're not just being a dick right now. They're, they're truly hurt and I need to you know, hear them out. Um, so that's kind of one side of it is the importance of voice in culture, team culture, team building, um, something that you miss out on. And when you have a physical office, you can walk over to that person and you can talk to them and say how they feel, right? Uh, when you have a remote team, that's, that thing's just not there. And what typically happens is like, hey, can I call you? Oh, no, I'm busy right now. Well, what about in 30 minutes? Sorry, I have another meeting, right? And so what we wanted to do was build a team uh, or a tool that allows you to immediately kind of get your voice out and be heard in that exact moment. And what's great is that on the other end, I can respond to it at my leisure whenever I have time as needed, right? Um, sometimes it may not even require a, a voice response. I could say, hey, just so you know, like I got your message. I'll write you an email up tonight when I've cooled down, right? But the ability for me to be able to vocalize how I'm feeling is super important. Now, to your point about documentation, that's where we're building in things with transcription, right? So this idea that if I needed to save something, I could say, hey, send that to Slack or you know, download that transcription and then it's searchable and it's stored permanently. And that way things aren't being missed because one of the things that we see Yak as is kind of your replacement for sticky notes, right? So I know my wife, when she's at work, she works at Marriott and uh, what she typically does is she'll write up a sticky note for something she needs one of her you know, team members to do. And she'll mm -hmm. walk over and just stick it to their computer screen so that when they come back in from lunch, they're like, oh, okay, cool. Like that's a thing that I need to accomplish, right? And so we're trying to replace that you know, thing that, again, you get in a physical office that you don't get in a remote team that essentially will just get lost in Slack. You know, I know you mentioned before our call that a lot of people are saying that Slack is very noisy. Um, I think there's a time and place for Slack. I don't think we're trying to replace Slack at all. Uh, but typically what does end up happening is some requests get sent like, hey, I need you to take care of this. And it just gets buried in all kinds of lines of text and all kinds of other conversations. Or it was sent in a DM and then another conversation was started in a general mm -hmm. chat. And so like I missed my DM, right? right? And so what we're trying to do is cut through all that noise and be like, oh, this is important. It's on Yak, right? Like this is a voice message that someone sent me, they took the time to actually, you know, record their voice, I should listen to this. And then yeah, if it's something like a task that you need to do, we're building in functionality to actually snooze, right? So you could snooze a yak and have it come back to you in like an hour so that you can pay attention to it again, almost building it like a task list, voice based tasking, right? But then the other di uh, way, of course, is, you know, send a slack, boom click a button, it sends the transcription and the audio file. Now it's searchable and it's in your kind of team archive. So does that, you know, clear it up for you? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. And I can also see like, um, I can see myself when I want to express something. Uh, if I need to say it out loud, it probably forces me to organize my thoughts a little bit more compared to just, you know, type it on Slack, right? Yeah, what's interesting about that is we've actually seen that be one of the biggest features that come out of Yak. Oh, wow. Um, okay. It's happened to myself. Actually, just literally the other day, I was on with one of our designers who's in Mississippi. And she said, hey, I really need to get on a call. And I said, hey, just use Yak. Like, that's what it's for, right? It's, we're, we're even still training our own team members to try and think right. in terms of, let's go async. We don't always have to get on a call, right? It's going to be like a exactly. culture shift. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but she started using it and she's like talking to me trying to explain this issue. And at the very end of the recording, she goes, you know what? Never mind. I really just needed to talk it out. Sometimes I just need to, you know, hear myself speak the whole issue out and then I can figure it out. She's like, I already got it. No worries. You know right? I can that's powerful. I can totally see that. I probably want to say something. And then when I um, listen to myself again, Hey, this sounds really stupid. i probably don't need it out loud, right? I sound really stupid. And, and probably I found a solution on that. So yeah, yeah I can see it. And I, I can also see the future where, um, you know, like in distributed companies like Hotjar or Zapier, as far as I know, they have this SOPs on how to ask for things or how to write on Slack. Um, I can see when it comes to voice, it's probably, okay, when you want to say something, here's how you, how do you want to say it so that, it's easy for a, the other party to digest. 
Okay. Yeah, we're also adding this functionality of being able to yak yourself. So yeah, that yourself. even if there's not a specific person that you need to say something to, you could mm -hmm. record kind of a voice memo to yourself, um, snooze it if you wanted to listen to it later, or simply just record it for almost like journaling purposes. And again, mm -hmm. it's that idea of like, once you vocalize a problem, you hear it out loud for the first time, you, your brain starts to process it in a different way. So mm -hmm. you have this opportunity to come at it from a different angle. You're hearing it kind of outside of yourself for the first time. So mm -hmm. you can about it as almost like a third party in a weird way right so yak has almost become this tool for uh just problem solving in general right this is kind of similar to um a, a popular writing tips is write like you talk right right like you speak so it's kind of also helps you mm -hmm. to um, articulate things better um i want to get back you mentioned that you you guys built yak because the problems that you see and on your client side and for your own team side. Is there any funny or weird anecdotes that make you guys think, God, I wish we have this thing? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest one is kind of what I said at the beginning is typically what we would see happen is a client would want a certain, you know, let's say we have five tasks for them. Well, they'd want five meetings for that day to go over all of those oh. five projects, right? Mm -hmm. And the the, the laughable thing for me was always like, when do you expect us to actually work, right? Are we supposed to do like nine to five meetings and then after 5 p.m. is when like the real stuff gets done? It's like, no, like this is our time that we're supposed to work. So when do you expect the work to get done if we're on a call with you all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And it's because I think a lot of companies, uh, we've already had to combat this enough. And I'm sure that even in your own business, you've seen this where a company says like, hey, we need to hire a team or we need to hire a dev or a designer, mm -hmm. but we need them on site. And you're like, mm -hmm. no, 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 like that's the <laughs> beauty of the internet is you can work remote. But like most companies are set up to expect and understand what an on-site employee does and there's accountability for that. And I think what happened with remote work is that most companies said, fine, we'll do remote work, but now we need like extra accountability. So we need to know that you're working all the time. And the way that that came out was, let's just put everybody in meetings all day long. Let's constantly check oh, in with them. Right. Let's have a yeah. active Slack chat, right? So let's yeah. constantly be talking because I don't know otherwise how to know if you're online. And the problem there is that's actually just distracting and incredibly non-productive, right? So what we wanted to do was build something that, again, it's laughable in my opinion, but most companies are saying like, no, 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 I need constant communication. Okay, right. But like, I need three hours of uninterrupted, you know, work. Mm -hmm. but no one bothers me. I can like turn Slack off, right? And like, no one's interrupting me, right? And so we built a tool to kind of fix that, in my opinion, hilarious setup where clients hire somebody right. and then never give them enough time to actually mm -hmm. work. So yeah, that's, that's what we've seen typically is we get hired and they're like, well, why isn't it done? And we're like, oh my God, man, we've been in a call with you for the last like four hours. No one, right. like what, when was the work supposed to get done? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that makes sense, especially when you're working with remote uh, developers or remote freelancers, right? Um, you want constant communication, mm, but also other than the fact that you also want to have less meetings. Um, ideally, if, if you are a freelancer, you have to report back to the clients, right? This is what I do today. And I think there are some freelancers that prefer to say it instead of just writing out loud. I mean, you, you, you've been writing code like for the whole day. I don't want to write another passage mm -hmm. of reports or work reports yeah. to the client. I just want to say, here, here's what I've done before. And you have any questions, do let me know. And if when you ship the transcription, feature is probably like the killing two birds in one stone. Yeah, right. I can totally see that. Right. Um, cool. And I want to just move back a little bit to the event that started the journey for Yak Chats. Um, so you guys started the whole thing from the Product Hunt Makers Festival is last year, right? Last November? Yeah. Right? Yeah. No. So in, in November, uh, Product Hunt launched their Makers Festival. It was the first one. So it's the first time they've ever done this. Um, it's interesting to see kind of where it's gone since then and kind of the process. It was crazy. There was so much confusion and so much um, disorganization on that first one. But the one thing that we saw immediately off the bat was remote tools was one of the categories. And so I don't know what it was about 
that category that just like sparked this. But as soon as I saw a category for remote work, I was like, I know exactly what I want to build. I just, I know exactly what I want to build. Mm -hmm. And so over the course of Thanksgiving break, we actually built the very first version of Yak. And at that time, it was actually called Yelling Across Cubicles. Right. Um, because the goal there was to, again, emulate that idea of like, hey man, like I need your help. Like, could you just... <laughs> come over to my desk for a second, right? Which is something that you have in a physical office that you miss out on in remote work. You know, when you are a remote worker, it's, I would say, relatively difficult to get a hold of someone. And when you are getting a hold of someone, it's usually interrupting their flow. And so what we wanted to do was kind of emulate this idea of just kind of like shouting across the, the cubicle row, right? And saying like, hey, dude, like, I have a question for you, right? And so the first version of yelling across cubicles or Yak, as it's now known, uh, was actually synchronous. So it was real time. It wasn't async. Um, but what it was is you would click a button on someone's face and your voice just immediately came out of their speakers. So instead of calling and dialing and all of the stuff that we've gotten used to with the way that voice communication tools work today, there was no rooms, there was no dialing, it wasn't a call. It was just I click a face, audio comes out of their speaker, and they can reply or they can not reply, right? It's almost, it was almost like an intercom, if you want to think about it like that, like an old school, like, hey, Peggy, could you please come into my office really quickly? Mm -hmm. um, and again, it was to emulate that idea of maybe they're not at their desk, right? And you just yelled into a black hole. And it was this idea of emulating real life. And it's interesting how it didn't work out in terms of us shifting, obviously, over to async. Mm -hmm. But the reaction to the app as a whole was incredibly good. Um, people loved it. We had tons of downloads. Uh, we ended, obviously, we ended up winning that category, right. um, which was really great. And I, I wouldn't say that I didn't expect it, but I certainly didn't expect the reaction. Uh, people were if you looked at like the whole list of everyone's upcoming projects, um, we had massively more email signups than everybody else. It was like that. It took that hacker space kind of project and people reacted to it like a real product, right? They looked at it and went, Oh, okay. Like I would use that. That seems like an actual thing instead of something somebody threw together over a weekend, which was literally right. what happened. Right. You know, we used a bunch of off the shelf technology <laughs> like Talkbox and okay. Electron right. to just like, put something together really quickly and it worked and it was functional and there was no sign up. Um, I know we talked about earlier about how being an agency, how that like what that transition to a startup looks like. And one of the things that I think leads really heavily into the way that we build our products is for that hackathon in particular. Well, we knew we only had a very limited amount of time to launch something. Mm -hmm. Right. And we knew we just needed one of the things that I always tell our customers is that, the least the, the the least amount of features that you have, like if you have mm -hmm. actual less features, it gives them less opportunity as a customer to complain, right? So your right. users have less to complain about if there are less features. And one of the things that we always do is say, you know, if you've got six features on your list, right? Launch two of them and do a hundred percent accuracy. Like these are just the most solid features in the entire world, right? right. Because if those two features are just a hundred percent solid then their users don't have something to say about the other ones, which may seem half-baked, mm -hmm. right? So at that time, like we didn't have authentication. You couldn't log in on like multiple machines under the same right. account. Um, we didn't have usernames. You just uh, got a randomly uh, generated six-digit code. Mm -hmm. So all these things that were kind of like hacks just to get this thing out and ship it and to ship this product. Um, and I know Justin Jackson, one of the things that he said that I think mm -hmm. is really cool is you never learn if you don't ship, right? right. So it was this idea of like, I have this idea. Let's throw it out into the marketplace. Let's make it as scrappy as we can possibly do and just see how people react to it. And people loved it. And what was interesting about that was the downloads that we got. You know, we had downloads from um, Roche Healthcare, which is like an enterprise healthcare company. Mm -hmm. I never in a million years would think would download like a scrappy little hackathon project. I figured they, you know, if they're like using link chat on their <laughs> Windows you know, ME machines. That's just, I don't know, that's the perception that I have of like an old school healthcare company. But no, they saw kind of the promise of like instant communication without all the extra crap that Skype and Slack and all these other tools give us. It was just pure, unadulterated voice. Mm -hmm. Boom. That's my coworker's voice. I just want to speak to them for a second and never again, right? So it's this idea of like blips, you know, in and out really quick, 
voice communication. Uh, so we had, you know, really healthy downloads, lots of good signups. We eventually launched like a website for it. Yeah. The original launch didn't even include a website. Um, oh, really? Got, yeah. No, we didn't even have a website okay. for it. We just had like a place that you could download it. There was no right. like screenshots or advertisements no or anything like that. No, no. It's okay. just like, here's the link to the actual product. Um, so, you know, people started signing up for the early access list because after we saw that kind of growth, immediate growth, what we did was we said, all right, well, let's invest some more time in this, right? Like, let's polish right. it up a little bit. Um, we did a complete rebranding of the logo, complete rebranding of the UI, and none of that stuff was launched yet. Um, but we were just kind of updating the existing app to make sure that it was stable for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, the, the hackathon is kind of what started it all. It was the poke that we needed to just say, hey, like, here's a subject line write a paper about it right? Right, right i was like okay it's like i got it i don't know there was something about it that just immediately popped in my mind what i wanted to do and we built it out the reaction was really great um you know we saw all kinds of different industries using it and yeah that's kind of what kick-started this whole thing mm -hmm. yeah um getting back into what you mentioned about how transitioning from agency to startups is actually helping a lot um in terms of your decision making, right? In terms of shipping. Yeah. So yeah, I definitely agree with you. Like, I think for all startup, you got to ship fast, right? But I have my, my hypothesis is that when you start up as a software development agency first, these, this mindset is more amplified because the ship fast mindset, quote unquote, you have to transfer it to your clients, every new clients. Okay. Do you really need these 10 features? You no, you only need two. And then, mm -hmm. A couple of weeks later, you do the same thing again. You say the same thing again. And getting back to your early beta users, so you wrote a blog post on Product Hunt about the story of the uh, the launch of Yak Chat, and you wrote that early beta users for Yak uh, includes CVS, Bleacher Report, HubSpot, Mailchimp, Envision, CBS, and many more. How did they find you? You know, I'm going to be frank and say, I have no idea. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things um, when I was talking, uh, I did a, a couple different interviews. And one of the things I've always brought up is it's really cool to ride somebody else's success train, right? And Product right. Hunt obviously has a, a good, healthy newsletter audience. They have lots of visits to the site on a daily basis. And that was audience metrics that we just didn't have to build, right? So there's this kind of marketing hack in participating in an event like this because I don't have to worry about building an audience. I don't have to worry about building an email list. I didn't even have to worry about sending an email, right? Um, Product Hunt took care of everything for me. And what's unique is most of Product Hunt's audience is immediately the audience that we're catering to anyway. There are mm -hmm. a lot of remote workers, a lot of like design and developers, a lot of product owners, right? With smaller right. teams, right? You're not looking at, even though we've had people from Google, you know, download the app, your typical audience member on Product Hunt is not like a massive company like Google. It's a smaller product startup. And those are the people that we want to target with Yak. Um, so yeah, I mean, literally, we just kind of put this thing out on Yak. We've never run a paid ad. We have, we've never put paid ads out there. Um, we did, a, I'm sure, tweets and a couple posts right. on like LinkedIn and stuff. But you know, overall, it was uh, a mention in the newsletter was huge. Um, I think when the uh, first uh, Makers Festival newsletter was released, they kind of said, hey, you know, voting has started. Here's a couple of our favorites. And mm -hmm. Yelling Across Cubicles was listed, which was really cool. Uh, obviously, they met, you know, the guys at Product Hunt said, hey, we think this one has some promise. Um, so I think that was a big part of it. There was a Medium post that was uh, written about some of the top products that we were mentioned in. And then, of course, there was just like the upcoming page and the voting page itself. And yeah, we just had literally at one point in time when this thing launched, we were getting an email sign up per minute mm -hmm. for like three days. So just like constant, constant wow. sign ups. And I'm doing nothing, right? We were just <laughs> sitting there enjoying free traffic. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, advice to other startup founders is definitely to try and find something like that. You know, it might be product hunt, but it could also be like another event. Uh, recently, <laughs> we're, we're talking on Zoom, right? But recently, Zoom had some amazing news come out about them mm -hmm. where they basically installed a Trojan on everybody's computer. Yes. Right? Um, so again, like that's an opportunity, maybe for us, but maybe for 
uh, a voice or video chat app to say like, hey, we, we're a video chat app that doesn't install Trojans on your computer, right? So riding kind of the, the, the train of an existing event or another company that's already doing all this marketing is a huge way to get users. Um, yeah, it's interesting because we just haven't put money into marketing yet and we already have a very healthy user base mm -hmm. of teams that have signed up on the early access list. Um, it'll be interesting to see kind of how we transition into just enjoying free traffic to actually having to pay for traffic. But right, right. Um, yeah, it's been really awesome so far, you know, being able to just kind of utilize existing audiences and existing newsletters and not have to worry about, um, you know, trying to market it ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I want to talk more about your team and about your, um, I want to talk more about your team and on um, how you guys are hiring now. So previously you were on this, a podcast called Makers Weekly, am I correct? Yeah. Uh, yeah. By the way, for listeners, if you want to learn more about the, the tech stacks for Yak Chat, go listen to the Makers Weekly episode with Justin. Um, Justin, um, just break down the whole technology using Ele Electron, TalkBox, and I guess you guys still use a bit of React on the development. So worth listening, so go listen to that. After this podcast, of course, don't run. Um, so yeah, um, one of the quotes that I pulled from there is you mentioned about, sorry, actually I should start. Can you share more about your team structure now? How many of, how many core team members do you guys have now and how many remote team members do you have? Yeah, so we uh, started as just, there's three co-founders here, uh, myself, mm -hmm. Jordan, and Hunter. Mm -hmm. And Jordan, uh, Jordan has actually been working out of our Orlando office uh, on mm -hmm. the so friendly side of things for a number of years now. Hunter actually moved out to LA and had been working remotely for us a little bit. Oh, so okay. he actually just recently came back to Florida. Um, inside of kind of our Orlando office, we actually have one core team member that's here kind of in the office every day. And then everybody else is kind of a mix Inside of the Orlando office here, we actually just have one designer that comes in every day. And then we have a mix of people that are kind of half remote, half in office, kind of come and go as they please. One of the things that I always wanted to do as a founder, especially with the agency, was to not put pressure on people to have to come into the office because I right. do believe that I can successfully run a remote team and not have to force people to be in the office nine to five. It's just not mm -hmm. the culture of the environment that I wanted. Mm -hmm. um, so we do have people that just kind of show up. <laughs> well, actually, we used to do free food on Thursdays. So everybody shows oh, up on God. Thursday, right? <laughs> um, right. But we do just have this mix of people that work from home, say 75% of the time, even if they already live in Orlando. So we still consider them kind of part of our remote team. Um, outside of the team here in Orlando, um, we started out with a guy that was in Guatemala. He mm -hmm. actually moved to Seattle and we had somebody in Cambodia, somebody in Mexico. Uh, we have a very large offshore development team in India as well. Mm -hmm. So we've got kind of people spread across the entire globe. Um, inside of our U.S. team, we have somebody in Mississippi, somebody in New Jersey. Um, and what's great about that from a hiring perspective in you know, I talked about this on other podcasts in the past, is this idea of not limiting yourself. Right. Um, what we found is that when you immediately as a company say like, I have to hire somebody in this town, the city, the state, whatever it may be, um, not only you're limiting yourself to the people, but you're also really boxing yourself into a price bucket, right? Right. And that's not to say, you know, everyone go hire offshore because it's cheaper. It's to say that, you know, a digital nomad that's living in Mexico or that's living in Guatemala has a very different uh, cost of living than somebody that lives in California, right? Mm -hmm. And I think especially, it's interesting, you told me the, the title of the uh, podcast at the beginning of this, mm -hmm. but this idea that there's so many startups in the Valley and when they're trying to hire, I think they're doing themselves a disservice by trying to hire in the Valley. Right. Cost of living is insane, right? It's totally. so hard to build a team when everybody has to be making, you know, $70,000 a year just to literally survive. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so what, what's great about being able to run a remote team like that is not only being able to open yourself up to amazing skilled people that might not just be geographically located to you, but also being able to maybe hire a couple extra people because the cost of living for those folks is very different. And so you can offer very competitive salaries for wherever they might be at currently 
and they're making great money and right. you're not losing a ton of money just because you have to have somebody in the office every day. Mm -hmm. uh, so we typically look for people uh, that are like digital nomads that love to travel and we can, you know, help with that lifestyle because mm -hmm. I think part of that lifestyle is finding a company or a client, you know, if, you, if they're contractor or employee, but finding that relationship with a company that is totally okay with the fact that right. you might not work the same time zone as them. Right? right. And being able to work around that. And so, you know, for us, we feel great because we're able to enable that lifestyle that they want and we're relaxed and we're chill. And as long as they get their work done, it doesn't really matter when they show up online. Right. And the flip side of that is that I get to hire somebody that is exactly perfect for me and I don't disqualify them just because they can't come into the office every day. Uh, so we've had really great luck, like just hiring on Reddit actually, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not even right. Like Reddit's, they have Reddit for hire, but it's not like an official hiring platform, right? There's no money and process and all that stuff. It's a community, right? And just being able to go to a community and say like, Hey, I'm looking for somebody. And someone pops up and says, Hey, I just finished some client work. Uh, you know, I'd love to work on this project, right? And being able to communicate, say, hey, you know, what time zone are you? What hours could you work? What's your availability look like? Boom, add them to the team, just like that. You know, no right. complicated interview process even. Right. Exactly. I think the key of all this, like the beauty of um, hiring remotely is that even if you are a Silicon Valley startup, you can actually find people with the same level of um, intelligence, the same level of development experience, and even soft skills and communication skills outside the valley, TM, outside the valley, um, wherever they are, right? Because I think if, like, if you're a Silicon Valley startup, like, I assume you're great, right? You're a big company and you have, like, this kind of, like, international opportunities. And I think... In, if you are an international talent, wherever you are, you're probably based in Asia or South America, you actually deserve to get these opportunities, right? Just, just because you're based in South America doesn't mean that you need to have your opportunities limited by that. Right. Yeah. I mean, remote work opens up not only an opportunity for Definitely. you as a company, but it's opening up an opportunity for the developer, the designer, right. or exactly. whatever the guy is that, you, you know, that you're hiring. You know, mm -hmm. They now have an opportunity as a startup that maybe they didn't have before because you know where they were born and that's a yeah. ridiculous limitation for an amazing employee opportunity right like you don't right. want to limit someone's employment just because of where they might live true so cool so i want to get back to your previous interview uh on the makers weekly podcast there is this one quote that um super fascinating for me you mentioned that ceo and cto are not being in the same room can cause a, uh, some kind of disconnection within the team. But when we're talking about creativity, it's much better when the teams are uh, distributed. I have two questions about this. First one, how did you realize this? Is there any, you know, any stories? And the second one, is the CEO and CTO disconnection thing is something that can be improved using voice tools like Yak Chat? Yeah. Um, I, yeah, there, there's many examples. I will try right. to give an example without blasting anyone in particular. <laughs> um, at, right. at my startup that I mentioned at the, the start of the call, um, it was something that I saw very often where, I, and I don't necessarily know that even today with that quote that I would necessarily say that it's definitely in the same room. Right. Let's go ahead and abstract that out to on the same page. Um, one of the things that we obviously are building is a tool to help you not be in the same room. But the whole purpose of that statement is to say, when there's a disconnect between the CEO and the CTO, someone who's leading the company, and especially in a tech company like this, where you're building a tech product. So at the end of the day, like the product is the company, but you have someone that's leading the company and someone who's leading the product, and they might be going down two different paths. Um, you end up at a very different spot than I think both parties thought they would end up. And so what I typically saw in my last startup was a CTO who was amazing, incredibly smart, knew exactly what he was doing, but definitely had an, a different end game than the CEO had. And that end goal being swapped and, and not at the same level caused a big chasm in the company, I think, in terms of the direction that it took, um, 
way, the way that it spent its money, the, uh, the way that we released products, uh, the products that we did release even. Right. And it's funny because that still comes back to my original ask of like, look, if you're going to build something, it needs to be user centered. What we typically saw was a CEO saying like, Hey, we need to ship product. We have to make money. Here's our, you know, roadmap. Here's our milestones. And then a CTO that was saying, this is a really cool fe feature. This is a really awesome patent. Um, this is amazing technology. Let's put this technology in the product because it's impressive. Ah, and the CEO saying like, dude, I just need you to sell something. Like we have to make money. Right. And so that issue of the CEO not being able to, I think the issue when I say not in, being in the same room is almost not even a communication thing. It's not that they're not communicating. It's that the CEO physically couldn't see what was being built, right? Mm -hmm. There was a disconnect between the product that was being built and okay. the product that was being sold. And it's the CEO's job to go off and get us funding and, you know, ensure the success of the company and keep pushing us forward. Right. And if they can't monitor what's actually being built and they're not selling what's being built or the CTO is not building what's being sold, right? Mm -hmm. Then that disconnect is just going to lead to, you know, bad times at your company. Um, and so, yeah, I definitely think that tools like Yak can, can fix that. You know, one of the first features that we're going to be adding back into the app because it actually got removed is screen sharing. And this uh, idea that um, your communication have context, right? And one of the things that actually got us one of our investors was this blog post written by Tyler Tringas um, talking about remote tools and remote communication. But one of the things that he said in there that I loved was high resolution communication. And this idea of if you're going to communicate, like make it as high right. resolution as possible, include a screenshot, include a screen share, have a video of you doing whatever you're trying to explain. Like hmm. Slack just doesn't cut it sometimes it and email just doesn't cut it sometimes. It's not to say that those communication methods shouldn't exist, but it's to say that like, look, if you're going to try and communicate something, make sure that you're using as high resolution as communication as possible so that the person on the other end has all the information they need. They understand the context. They can see what you're seeing and they can understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that bleeds into that CTO CEO discussion, which is, you know, if you're not going to be in the same room, you guys need to be communicating in a way that says, here's what I'm building. I'm checking in. I'm showing this to you. What are right. you selling? Oh no, here's what I'm selling. Let's make sure that there's a, you know, a matchup of these two things, right? Like I've told the investors we're building this. Oh, well that's not possible. That was the other thing that we actually saw a lot of times was, wow. you know, a CEO, especially one that's maybe non-technical, a lot of times will tell the investors like, oh yeah, yeah, this is what we're going to launch. And then the CTO is over there going, oh my God, why did you tell them that? I can't build that. That technology won't exist for 10 years, right? <laughs> um, and so unless you're like a moonshot company and that's what you're working towards, mm -hmm. um, having a mismatch on expectations on the technical side right. can really, really lead to a lot of problems. And we saw that happen a lot in that startup was the CEO appeasing an investor or answering a question maybe slightly you know, differently than it should have been answered and us getting it, you know, back into a corner where now we have to build something that we definitely right. never planned to build. And I think communication and high resolution communication is the thing that's going to solve that. All right. So, yeah, so I can see the patterns here. Um, like you mentioned, uh, early on the interview, you mentioned about the communication between agencies or freelance developers with the clients. And now it's basically the same thing between um, CEOs, CTOs, and other stakeholders within the company. So I guess basically for React Chat, the key is something like get people to be on the same, same page as soon as possible with less time, right? So you don't need five or six meetings per week to get on the same page. Instead, you just send voice messages. Yeah, I mean, the idea and this is actually what's the first line in our pitch deck is frequent casual check-ins via voice. Yeah. The idea of like very small interactions, but just checking in like, Hey man, you know, could you give me an update on this project? Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I just pushed code and it's ready to go live. I'll be testing it in the next, you know, five minutes. Boom. End of conversation. You know, another two hours go by. Hey, I just tested the code. Like it's good to go. I've pushed it live, you can test it, and I dropped the link in your Slack, right? So it's this idea of using your voice, again, is going to create more meaningful relationships. Mm -hmm. It's also faster, we feel. A lot of times you overthink things when you're typing something out, trying mm -hmm. to vocalize something. 
um, over text and making sure you don't have typos, making sure it's formatted nicely. You don't you right. know, look like an idiot to everybody in the group. It's just easier to just do it right, over right, voice right. sometimes. Yeah. I honestly can see that. Like, for example, if someone is um, asking for update and he or she is using via voice, I probably feel more um, obligated to reply to them. Even if I haven't finished the thing, I probably still feel obligated to at least tell them uh, yeah. via voice. Like, a Slack yeah. message is much easier to ignore, right? Yes. But when exactly. somebody took the time to actually send you a voice message, you're like, I, I should reply. <laughs> like voice, Slack message, and then emails. emails right. Like yeah, exactly. Right, right. So yeah, um, I want to end it with the, um, the big picture of the whole remote work scene. Recently, we have this kind of, of movement, I guess, of apps and products that help you to work asynchly. Um, we have Yak Chat here, of course, and we have Twist, which is developed by the Doist team to create a great product like the Todoist and so on. So in your opinion, what's next for async remote work? Yeah, and I'll take that even one level higher. And I think mm -hmm. that we're we're also in a resurgence right now of what I like to call passive entertainment or even passive learning. Uh, we see podcasts being very popular right now. A lot right. of people are switching over to audiobooks. It's this idea of that you could do things. Um, I mean, it, it comes down to efficiency, right? Like I can read a book while I drive, which without an audiobook was just previously something that you couldn't do. Right. And I think that Twist and all these other async tools they're at the at the core it's the same principle it's this idea of you can work and still communicate right it's this idea of being able to do more than one thing at a time because we have tools that will allow us to be more productive and so you know a tool like yak is not only there to say like hey you can work asynchronously um, but it's also there to say you can listen to an update you can speak an update um, i actually a lot of times will be on a call with a client right or a customer, or even like an interview, right? And a yak will come in for me, and I will mm -hmm. listen to it while I'm on the call and reply just by simply muting like my, my Zoom mic, because I'm able to actually communicate with that person just by you know sending them a quick yak in the middle of an existing meeting, right? So it's this idea of like being able to multitask and do more than one thing at a time, and it not being a distraction or taking you away from what you're working on. So for us, we see the future of remote work being this idea of like, you can work mobile, you can work from wherever, when, whenever, right? And on top of that, you can consume updates, give your stand up, communicate kind of passively. Uh, one of the things that I know that Hunter, you know, one of my co-founders has been talking about is this idea that like, while he's in the car, he could just send yaks to people instead of mm -hmm. like texting and driving, which is obviously terrible, right? He could just like, you know, hey Siri and, you know, send somebody a yak. And that way he doesn't have to, you know, get distracted. He can still communicate effectively. Um, and yeah, it's this idea of like being able to do things um, asynchronously and passively. So for the future of yak, a lot of what we're thinking about is how you consume information. So we've the, we just entered into this last uh, product hunt makers festival as well. Mm -hmm. um, we built something that we call yak bot. Okay. And it's this kind of, chat bot riff but with voice right. uh, we love our alexas and our google homes but they're relegated to hardware and they're also loud for everybody so we have like an alexa uh, echo dot in the office over there actually and everybody hates it because i'll like <laughs> ask for the weather or something right because right. i need to know you know some information or when my next calendar meeting is but it like speaks it to everybody right it's not like a private mm -hmm. thing and so we're trying to take that concept and actually embed it inside of Yak. So this idea of like a very work focused, very asynchronous, passive learning and entertainment system. So, you know, you could have a podcast inside of Yak one day, maybe. Okay. Right now we're adding really simple stuff like the latest TechCrunch article or the, right. you know, the newest article from the Wall Street Journal. It gets read to you over audio. Uh, we're also thinking about accessibility, right? So what's great about remote teams is that it enables somebody with disabilities to work on your team because they don't have to show up in an office. Yes. They don't have to work around existing office, you know, systems. They can work in their home where their home is set up for that disability. And what's awesome about that is with something like Yak, we can help vision impairment by maybe bringing them a little bit more into Slack 
than they could have been previously. So imagine having Slack, you know, a Slack message read out to you by the person, you know, who actually sent that, right? Their voice even. We're working with a couple companies that are replicating voices using AI. So this idea that now my Slack message is read to me, maybe even my email is being read to me. The, you know, the top product hunt product of the day is being read to me. And so this idea that Yak is kind of this central repository for business and work and communication, but also just passive entertainment and consumption. And I think that that's a lot of where remote work is going is this idea that you can just be at a coffee shop and you could, you know, listen to the status updates for the day while you're working. And, you know, the idea of remote work as a whole is this, um, you know, no boundaries, like time zones don't matter. Location doesn't matter. Language doesn't even matter anymore. Right. We have all these tools like help people communicate. And I really want Yak to be at the forefront of that by right. providing, you know, additional tools on top of that layer to say, look, we're going to enable you to work better, work more efficiently, communicate better and communicate better, uh, you know, more efficiently. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, that's that's sort of where we see the landscape of remote work and I think entertainment in general with this resurgence of podcasts and audiobooks and all these different ways that, that we're relearning how to consume information as our lives become busier and more chaotic. Justin, thank you so much for your time. And where can we find you online? And how can we try Yak Chat? Yeah, so you can find me on Twitter. I'm at jmitch, J-M-I-T-C-H. Um, Yak.chat for our website. Uh, right now, it's invite only. Uh, so you'd have to either request an invite from somebody else that's already using it, or you just need to sign up on the website. Uh, we have kind of a two-step sign up. So if you do sign up, you'll eventually get an email with like a referral code you can share to other people. And we'll bump you up the wait list. But there's also kind of like a shortcut key, which is as soon as you sign up, there's a little uh, link underneath the sign up form that will allow you to fill out like a full onboarding survey. And that, that requires some some time. So we understand right. that if someone's going to put in that effort, we should automatically bump them up that wait list. That is super smart, actually. Uh, great customer development. Uh, not trick. I hate the word trick. Great customer development process. So yeah, right. absolutely. So yeah, yak.chat and at jmitch, um, at yakchat on Twitter. You know, ask us questions, follow us. Um, we're super involved in the remote work community. So if there's a thing that bothers you that you think we could solve, you know, hit us up. We'd love to add as a feature. Awesome. Justin, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate it. And that's it for another episode of Outside the Valley brought to you by ARC. We created this podcast with the hope that in each episode, you can learn something new from other remote startup people. So if you have any feedback or suggestions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me at jovian at arc.dev. It's j-o-v-i-a-n at a-r-c dot d-e-v. Or you can find us on Twitter at arc.dev. See you next week with another episode of Outside the Valley and ciao.